Would you please pray with me? Lord, would the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A few years ago, I got trained and certified as a habit coach. I studied under a Stanford researcher whose habit formation technique is so successful that he holds a certain distinction. His claim to fame, or perhaps infamy, is namely this. He taught all the guys in Silicon Valley who got us hooked on smartphones how to do it. That's right. The developers of the social media platforms Facebook and Twitter, as well as other norm numerous tech startups, all were in his class and studied how to get people to tap, 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 tap on the glowing little screen in the palm of our hands. Now, recent statistics suggest this might have been one of the most transformative college classes in human history. A 2016 survey uh, found that the average user of smartphones tap 2,617 times per day on that little screen. Taps, swipes, clicks. For heavy users, that number can rise to over 5,400 touches per day. Apple itself reports that iPhone users unlock their devices about 80 times in a single day, which translates to about every, once every 12 minutes during waking hours. And those taps translate into a ton of time on such devices. A 2024 study shows that the average American now spends about 171 minutes, nearly three hours per day on their smartphone, with some users, especially the younger generation, spending over twice that much. Now, more than 50% of all Americans also confess their fear that they are addicted to their smartphone. <laughs> this overdependence is not just about time, it also impacts other aspects of our health and well being. Smartphone addiction has been linked to problems such as anxiety, stress, depression, and particularly driven by heavy social media usage. It also contributes significantly to sleep deprivation as late night screen exposure and the blue light emitted by these devices disrupt our sleep cycles. And speaking of sleep, how have you been sleeping lately? Good? Do you get enough good sleep? Enough deep, restful sleep? If you are like most Americans, you would also not have good answers to these questions. A 2023 Gallup poll showed that over 73% of American adults report getting fewer than the recommended eight hours of sleep per night. Up to 20% of all respondents routinely get five hours or less. And the consequences of chronic, persistent sleep deprivation have long been well known. Lack of focus and decreased productivity at work, higher stress and greater irritability in general, and over the long term, increased incidence of heart disease, dementia, and diabetes. And the list goes on. And yet here we are in sleep deprivation nation, mainlining our smartphones. If that's you, guess what? It's also me. I too have a hard time disconnecting most days from my iPhone. I mean, there are so many worthy things begging for my attention on that glowing little device, so much so that a fellow priest friend once called me his great eye priest. I wish I could have a different distinction than that, but that's the way it goes sometimes. And I go back to my Stanford professor who taught me about habits. The grandfather of smartphone addiction is a guy by the name of B.J. Fogg. And he has devoted his life and his tiny habits method to training folks like me how to form instead good, healthy habits. I can hardly recommend it. But I'm not here this morning to lead a self-help seminar 
or sign you up for my habit coaching program, or even an altar call to come forward and where you lay your smartphone down at the altar. I am, however, here to preach on the second of the three R's in our church's mission statement, rooted, restful, relational. And it's this context that strikes me how countercultural again our statement is. We Americans, generally speaking, are not a restful people. We never have been. I recall when I was growing up, the threat to our restfulness was more American workaholism. Call it the Protestant work ethic run amok. And it was also fueled by the Cold War. In the battle of ideologies, we felt we needed to outproduce the Soviet bloc. So striving for wealth was itself a political weapon. To quote Gordon Gecko, the fictional corporate raider in the 1987 film Wall Street, greed is good. Greed works. Greed captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all its forms. Greed for life, for money, for love, for knowledge has marked the upward surge of mankind. So bottom line, work as hard as you can to get as much as you can and take down the evil empire along the way. Now today, I think in 2024, I'm not sure workaholism has necessarily gotten any better. It just afflicts percentage-wise fewer of us. The best stats put it at maybe 5 to 10% of us. Instead, back in 1985 already, author Neil Postman was prophet of the world we now live in, arguing that we are amusing ourselves to death with screens delivering entertainment 24-7-365. Either way, whether entertaining or working ourselves to death, Rest is as elusive as ever for most of us. But then there are Jesus' words that I just read a few moments ago. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus promises us rest. But do we experience it? Those words sometimes taunt me. Jesus' words, on the one hand, feel like a kind of oasis in the desert. But where is that oasis? How do I find it? It seems really far off sometimes. So let us this morning turn to God's Word, where rest is a vitally important concept, and where there is surprisingly practical help for the weary, too. We first want to look at rest in the Old Testament, and then in the New. And finally, we'll come back to us, to the weary, seeking rest. How can we be a restful church? How can we be a haven for the weary? Rest in the Old Testament. The Old Old Testament concept of rest is rooted in the practice of Sabbath, whose roots go all the way back to the creation. After six days of creation, God rests on the seventh day, setting it apart as holy. We read that in Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. Why did God rest? Does he need sleep? No, God was not weary. He didn't need a break. He rested for two reasons. First, the seventh day marked the completion, the perfection of creation. It was a sign that God's work was done. Draw a line under the work. And it is good just as it is. Nothing more needed. The Sabbath, in other words, is a sign of sufficiency. Enough is enough. God also rested for us to establish a rhythm of work and rest for humanity. The Sabbath thus signifies both the order of creation and the need for human beings to rest from our work as well. He knew our finite limitations, and so he modeled for us the good and healthy way to live. But it was also a practice of trust. You see, if you stop working for a day, a whole day, 
You are acknowledging by your very action that you have enough. That work can subside for a day. And then can safely resume after rest. That rest, if you will, is no threat to your well-being. Why? Because in the six days of work, God's provision is enough. And will resume soon enough too. In fact, this same pattern is played out in the wilderness in the book of Exodus where God commands them to gather manna only for six days and the sixth day's manna provision will be enough for the seventh. So they don't even have to go out and gather on the seventh day. So rest on the seventh day became a pattern for human life. Six days of labor followed by one of rest. This cycle honors the God of creation and acknowledges that human beings are finite, that we're dependent upon God for our sustenance and our flourishing. For Israel then and still for us today, observing Sabbath rest reinforces that life is not solely defined by productivity and work, but also by worship and fellowship with God. That is why we worship on the Sabbath. We set aside the weekly rhythm of work for worship, to honor the Lord of creation, the originator of all work. So the Sabbath became central to Israel's covenant relationship with God as well. In the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment mandates the observance of the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This command is reiterated in our Old Testament reading for today. In this command, the Israelites are to cease from labor, reflecting God's rest from after creation, even at the risk of death. You see, the commandment explicitly links the Sabbath with creation, but also with the redemption of Israel from slavery in Egypt. By observing the Sabbath, Israel remembers God's creative and His redeeming work recognizing that they belong to God and not to the forces of economic production or social systems that would pull us out of rest and into ceaseless activity. Finally, the Sabbath was not only a sign of God's covenant with Israel, but also an act of justice and compassion. It applied to everyone in the community, including servants, foreigners, and even animals, this was unique, utterly unique in the ancient world. And it ensured that the vulnerable in society could rest and experience the same rhythm of life that God prescribed for all creation. The Sabbath day was thus an equalizer, highlighting God's concern for justice and social well-being. And this Sabbath rest extended even to nature as well. In the Old Testament agricultural laws, the land was to have a Sabbath rest every seventh year, the year of Jubilee. The people were not to sow or harvest, but instead to trust that God would bless them with abundance in the sixth year to provide for that year of rest. Here, rest extends beyond just the human realm to the very earth itself, which is given time to rejuvenate reinforcing the idea of holistic rest that permeates even to the very soil under our feet. Needless to say, we don't do that very well <laughs> nowadays. Because you see, the Old Testament, though, I think understands something really profoundly important, and it frames Sabbath as an anticipation of a deeper and ultimate rest that is connected both with the land and with God's promises, indeed with God's great deliverance work for all of creation. You see, after their deliverance from Egypt, Israel's entry into the promised land is depicted as an entry into God's rest. The land represents a place where the people can dwell securely, free from their enemies, and live in communion with God. Yet failure to Sabbath was nothing new even to them. The prophets like Jeremiah indicated that Israel's failure to observe the Sabbath and live faithfully resulted in their exile, losing the rest that was promised to them. The ultimate rest, therefore, 
becomes a future hope pointing to a time when God will eventually restore his people in creation. So in the prophetic literature, such as Isaiah 66, that literature envisions a time when all of humanity will enter into this final Sabbath rest, worshiping God in fullness. You see, in general, in the Old Testament, rest is a sign of trust. Rest is associated with faith and trust in God's provision. The command to rest on the Sabbath required the Israelites to trust that God would provide enough for their needs even when they weren't working. And it goes further than that. Even the rest, for instance, at night. When you lay down to sleep and close your eyes and you can't do anything (laughs) is a deep expression of trust that this world is in God's hands. The sun will rise in the morning. There will be restoration of the day's work. The sun will rise and work will resume. God has given us enough. Enough. (laughs) That, I submit, is the core of Sabbath practice. It is a living, breathing act of recognition that we have enough. What is in your life and mine that drives us to think that we don't have enough? I confess I'm as guilty as this as the next person. Where are you seeking more? As if what you have now is not enough. What maybe leads you to feel like you need to work more or tap more (laughs) in order to get that enough? See, our very ability to disconnect is a barometer of our trust in God. That he's got this so we don't have to. Can we do that and do it well? Let's now take a look at the New Testament and shift our focus there. Because our gospel reading sets the stage for this. That Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. You see, in the New Testament, the teaching about rest revolves both around a present spiritual reality and a future hope, deeply intertwined in the work and person of Jesus. This rest is distinct from mere physical relaxation. It's an invitation to cease striving, both in terms of labor and in your spiritual effort to try to find true peace and wholeness in God on your own terms. In Matthew 11, Jesus famously invites the weary and burdened to come for him to rest. These haunting, maybe taunting words, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This passage captures the essence of rest in Jesus. Here, rest is not merely physical, Jesus sees into the soul and realizes we need a release from the burdens of life, particularly from the heavy expectations of the law and of human striving for righteousness through our own vain attempts. Jesus contrasts his yoke with the legalistic burdens imposed by religious leaders of his time, offering an easier, grace-filled alternative. His yoke involves following him in humility and trust, learning from his gentleness rather than laboring under the crushing weight of religious obligation. Interestingly, immediately after this invitation, then Jesus addresses the issue of the Sabbath. His disciples are criticized, <coughs> excuse me, for plucking grain on the Sabbath, an act considered unlawful by the Pharisees. But Jesus responds by redefining the Sabbath, teaching that he is Lord of the Sabbath and offers the true meaning of rest, not tied to strict legal observance, but to a relational trust in God. The Sabbath's deeper purpose is to point toward the rest found in Christ, a rest not confined to one day of the week, but now extending to every aspect of life. Jesus' teaching on rest 
And Sabbath is directly connected to our third R, which is our focus next week. So a bit of foreshadowing here. He is rest. It invites the question for us, is he your rest actively on a daily basis? Because true rest is found in Jesus being enough for you. Sure, you have work that you have to go about. There are other human needs and wants which are not wrong and not ungodly when in proportion and found out of a heart that rests in Jesus. That's the core teaching also of our epistle reading for today from Hebrews. The author there of Hebrews draws on the history of Israel and warns believers today not to follow the example of Israel's disobedience and unbelief, which led them to forfeit entry into God's promised rest and true possession of the promised land. That promised land symbolizes peace and security, but the underlying meaning even there is you only get that from trusting God. It doesn't come from militarily inhabiting the land. Hebrews 4 through 4 verses 1 through 11 develops this theme and interprets the Sabbath rest as a greater spiritual reality. The author insists that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's like it's still there if only you'll grasp it. You see this rest is both a present experience and a future hope reflecting a trust in God's completed work through Jesus. Just as God rested after creation, believers are now invited to cease from their own works and enter into the rest provided through faith faith in Christ's finished work on the cross. The rest described then in Hebrews is not merely physical, but represents a broader cessation from the striving of self-justification and the burdens of sin, even from that sinfulness, that finite weakness in us that just strives for more, constantly wanting more. Hebrews 4.3 emphasizes that we who have believed enter that rest. It's there waiting for you. But it's accessible only if you really trust the Lord. Where does our faith, our trust truly lie? You see, when we strive, either for righteousness in the eyes of God, or status in the eyes of others, or even after pleasure and other good things created for our enjoyment, we are enslaved. It's like we are on a constant treadmill. But to return daily, even hourly, whenever we feel the need for whatever enslaves us, to return to Jesus is or can be true relief, released. It is the foundation of all true rest. Let me share a story here with you briefly. It's about a friend of mine. I'll call him Roger. He was the member of a church where I once served, and he came to me once for confession on Good Friday. Note here, I normally, normally confessions are 100% confidential. <laughs> so I received his permission to share a version of this story with you, purposely changing a few details for anonymity's sake. As we discussed what Roger came to confess, it became clear that he, who had been in successful substance abuse addiction recovery for several years, also had sexual appetites that were ensnaring him. He then confessed several sexual sins and an ongoing vulnerability to various lustful desires. Though a committed, baptized believer, he kept falling into sin in this area of his life. As we prayed together, pleading the cleansing blood of Jesus and seeking his renewing grace, We both sensed the Lord was leading Roger to a deep brokenness, but also to an even deeper freedom. The Holy Spirit was truly present. Tears flowed freely, but they were tears of joy as much as of sorrow. 
I continued to meet with Roger for several weeks, and eventually we would check in only occasionally for some accountability. But each time was nothing but joy. For the Lord truly had set Roger free. It was a miracle. He had delivered Roger from what looked like a sure one-way path to another addiction. Yes, there were moments of temptation, but the Lord had fundamentally redirected his heart's desires to where the temptations just did not have the same pull on him anymore. He confessed to me that he learned that day that he could really trust the Lord in this area of his life so he could let go of these restless sexual cravings. And the Lord just gave him a deep and abiding rest. That's the idea here. That sin, our own restless wayward desires are a cruel taskmaster that won't let us really rest. Now back to us for a moment in conclusion. How do we as a church become a better, better, healthier place of rest? How might we be a haven for the weary? I think there are three concrete ways. First is our weekly worship. I love this quote from the book, um, St. Augustine's book, The Confessions. It's near the very beginning of it. It's a classic quote, but it's so appropriate here. You arouse us so that praising you may bring us joy because you, God, have made us and drawn us to yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. You catch that? Worship, in other words, is the heart's true home. It should be a place of rest. When we come together each week, we are here to meet the Lord because we need His true rest. And when we experience the joy of hearing His Word speak deeply into our lives, of meeting Him and His presence in the table, we have our joy renewed and refilled because joy is what gives the heart its energy, not happiness. (laughs) You might notice the difference here. Joy is this abounding, abundant sense of enough and a sense of happiness or satisfaction out of enough. But our forms of happiness are oftentimes so much more directed at what we don't have than at what we do. But joy is the experience of enough. Don't we get that when we gather for worship? Some sense that the Lord is truly enough? That to be in his presence with his people is enough? That is certainly my hope and prayer for us as a church. Worship is the heart's true home and where we should be. Second, this joy, this word of Christ's salvation is something we need to share with others who are lost as well. You see, If we have the key to rest, then we got to share it with other people. It's not meant to be bottled up here, but it's meant to be given away. You realize the gospel is this message of rest for the weary. So perhaps you know a co-worker who's caught in the devastating snare of workaholism or a friend who can never seem to get enough money or maybe a family member who can't seem to get enough love or respect or whatever it is, perhaps you know a Roger in your life. Enough is a message of deliverance. It points to Jesus and it sets people free. And we need to be a church that's not ashamed of sharing this treasure, this rest with others. And then finally, as we go forth sharing that with others, we always need to ask ourselves, Where do we need to heed that message ourselves better? And part of that is I would like us to be a people who practice something that that the Lord himself tried to set his people free from Egyptian bondage for. You know, when he first came to Pharaoh, 
Moses was to say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. This was reiterated in a later passage in Exodus 7. The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. What God was doing was he was calling his people to a time of retreat. That's the word, contemporary word we use for it. You see, God invites his people sometimes to these special moments to pull us away from the rhythm of the everyday. And we can be just such a church as well. I love Anglican spiritual writer Evelyn Evelyn Underhill. And she, I'll conclude with these words. She talks about spiritual retreat in a really profound way. Anyone can retire to a quiet place and have a thoroughly unquiet time in it, she says. But that is not making a retreat. It is shutting of the door which makes the whole difference between a true retreat and a worried religious weekend. Shut the door. (laughs) It is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. Not everyone who pulls it to and leaves it slightly, or she said, no, no, nearly everyone pulls it to and then just leaves it slightly ajar so that a whistling draft comes in from the outer world with all the reminders of all the worries, interests, conflicts, sorrows of daily life. That's the key. Where is the door in your life and mine still ajar? And can we as a church be a people who can shut it? Who can truly say, enough is enough. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.